cruising right along with technical difficulties. I think I bumped a button there. Okay. Hominid evolution. So we've made our way through Earth history, through vertebrate evolution, and we've arrived at a discussion of the evolution of our own clade here with a discussion of hominid evolution. And as has happened uh, through much of this discussion of deep time, it's going to be a broad brush stroke type presentation where we're leaving out so many of the interesting details, leaving those for other courses, of which there are a lot here on campus, including an in integrative biology and an in anthropology for studies of human evolution. This is a, um, a department that spends a lot of time on the subject, and there are labs dedicated to it and plenty for you to, uh, to work on here in, in IB and anthropology. So we'll, we'll look at a few of the highlights of early hominid evolution in Africa, and then watch as hominids moved out of Africa first early, around 1.8 million years ago, with evidence of hominid migration out of Africa in Eastern Europe and in Southeast Asia, and then later with the emergence of Homo sapiens, our species, and the movement of Homo sapiens out of Africa in at least a second wave of emigration. Probably there were other waves of movement in between that aren't as well resolved. And we'll try to finish with a, um, with a local um, picture, albeit a, uh, an inadequate one, of humans arriving in California. So remember this crew, the um, extant hominids. Now, where are we on our phylogeny? Grab a eraser here. Phylogenies, cladograms, are extremely useful for just orienting ourselves, figuring out where we're, what we're talking about in context, in a biological context for any discussion in biology uh, that pertains to organisms. So remember we have uh, gibbons, our lesser apes, as an outgroup, and then we have our great apes, including orangutan, pongo, the genus, and then who do we have after that as a branch? Gorillas. Gorillas, yes. Gorilla, that's the genus, so I underline it, gorilla. Who else? Chimp, genus pan, chimpanzee and bonobo, right? Who else? Us. Homo sapiens. All the work of one student here, I think. Well done. But who else? Well, there's lots happening in here. All extinct. Now, when we say hominids, what do we mean by hominids? A lot of people would put that, and these are debated taxonomic points. I'll just give you one version of what's possible here. A lot of people would put that around here, hominids, and I'll capitalize it. I'll make it formal. Hominidae, with the classic suffix of a mammalian family, idae, on the homin root. And you'd put it here to include gorilla and everyone else, but leaving out poor orangutan from the family. And then you would call this family something like Pongidae, relegating it to a different family. The genetic differences here are pretty well resolved. And orangutan's pretty far outside the rest of this group. Gorilla is more closely related to human than gorilla is to orangutan, sharing a more recent common ancestor. But pan, the chimpanzees and bonobos, are more closely related to humans than they are to gorillas in terms of sharing a more recent common ancestor and more genetic similarity. 
And so you would have another, a need for another name here, and you could call it hominine, changing your suffix, see? Ine instead of ide with the same prefix root. So what about all of these creatures that went extinct that are more closely related to us than they are to chimps and sharing a common ancestor here? We need a name. Let's use hominini and inini. And that's traditional for a tribal um, designation in, the, in a Linnaean ranking scheme. This would be a tribe, hominini. And thus, when we speak of humans and human ancestors in a study of the paleoanthropology of this group, it's the hominins. Hominin. Hominins. So if you say you're studying hominids, you mean you're studying a larger grouping, including the great apes. But if you're studying the hominins, you mean a more local context here for your studies, okay? All right, so Australopithecines, I'll be using several terms, and you should try to get a handle on what they refer to. I will highlight the key terms in the terms list. The Australopithecines, and would you like the light down for the images? Some people in the back are nodding. Um, thank you very much. Australopithecines were first discovered in 1924. It's a singular moment in the history of paleoanthropology with Raymond Dart being delivered a crate full of fossils that these miners in a quarry, in a lime quarry, had blasted out and recognized as unusual and put into a box and sent to this anatomist in Johannesburg, South Africa. And he recognized from this... Um, fossil skull that he received, that he was dealing with something that was not human, was not ape, but something in between. He saw it as a missing link between apes and humans. He knew this because he was a neuroanatomist, and there was a cast of the brain preserved where the skull bones had broken away. The sediment inside preserved a cast of brain structure. And he could read the brain of this creature as not being human, not being great ape, and he called it a man-ape. And that was the beginning of these studies of paleoanthropology in Africa. Africa, where Darwin had surmised human evolution must have occurred. Although others at this time, at the time when Raymond Dart was working, were focused in Asia. This discovery of darts wasn't appreciated by Europeans for a couple decades. For one thing, gosh, it shouldn't be an Australian guy living in South Africa finding the first fossil. It had better be a, someone from France or Spain or America to do this, not someone down here studying off in the hinterlands and finding one of the most important fossils in history. So there was a bias against it for uh, jealousy reasons, maybe, or um, nationalistic reasons or something like that. But eventually, the evidence was o became overwhelming because Dart and his colleagues, especially this, this guy, Robert Broom, kept finding more fossils, more and more evidence for a history of humankind and humankind's ancestors down in this area. Now, Darwin had suspected that as Africa as the cradle of human evolution. Why? Why did Darwin think it must be here and not elsewhere? Main reason? Think about your phylogeny and think about biogeography. There were a lot of primates in that area. Not just any old primates but our closest relatives, which they knew anatomically resembled us most, Pan and Gorilla, are only in Africa. Orangutan resembles us to a degree. It's not in Africa. It's clearly outside the other group. 
of Pan and Gorilla. So on biogeographical grounds, he was making an assumption about where human evolution should have occurred, probably occurred, and this evidence was supporting that. Australopithecus means the southern ape, uh, Australo, south, pithecus, meaning ape. So Dart named it Australopithecus, the southern ape, this man ape, this missing link. Since then, a lot of fossils have been found for this record. It's actually a relatively good record. As far as vertebrate clades go, this is a decent record. There's a lot, there are a lot of fossils. There's an inordinate amount of attention paid to these fossils by scientists because of their relevance and importance. But from Ethiopia to South Africa, stretching through the Rift Valley of East Africa, through Kenya, through Tanzania, into Malawi, with a break, not much known from this area, and including a bunch of important stuff from South Africa, as well as a few things from Chad to the west. But geographically, that's it. Nothing from in here. Can you make a hypothesis about this distribution? Is that the only place where hominid ancestors lived? Or might they have lived elsewhere and not just not been found? Say they lived elsewhere and have not been found in this region. Why, why not? Why not there? Yes, please. Maybe this area was not good for making fossils, for fossilization, so a taphonomic argument, right? What is it about this region that might be relevant in that regard? It's a f mostly forested, right? This is equatorial forest. It's the Congo forest zone. You can see it in a vegetation map. It's very dense. And trees, healthy, rich forest environments, aren't great for fossils. Even if they've been preserved and they're in the ground, guess what trees like to do? They like to eat fossils, more or less literally. They penetrate them with their roots, they dissolve them, they explode them, they take in the nutriment that's in the fossils because there's a lots of nice um, trace, um, lots of nice minerals for the plants to use. So they use them, they destroy them. They're also hard to find because when you go walking and looking for fossils, you're essentially walking and looking for fossils. You don't go out and dig, you just walk around and look as a starting point to look for fossils, usually with some guide about the geology, about where to go. But you're just walking around the ground looking. And in this area, there's vegetation that you can't see through. It's green and lush, more or less, in most of that area. Whereas in here, in these, in these drier, eroded gullies and rifts and ravines in these badlands, you get the erosion every year with rain that exposes fossils sequentially. And renew, they, it renews them so that you can go the next year in areas where you looked last year but didn't find anything. If it rains, next year you might find something because erosion has happened. So a rich record has developed going all the way back to 6.5 million years ago and extending through an important genus called Artipithecus named by Berkeley scientists, and Australopithecus to the human lineage, Homo. I like to just try to use human, the English word, to pertain to members of genus Homo, but you can use human to refer to these creatures as well if you want. Just define your terms. It's just an English usage. Scientifically, the terms are better diagnosed and defined. And then an important group up here called Paranthropus, the robust Australopithecines. So these are Australopithecines. These are robust Australopithecines. Robust, right? And it actually means that they had really big heads. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't tall. None of these creatures back here were tall. They, I mean, they're small, like this. You know, it's maybe standing on two legs starting here. Yes. Bipedal, but small and with small brains, brains the size of chimpanzee brains, ape-sized brains, small of stature, but on two legs. And we'll look at some of the anatomy of these different creatures. But these are your main genera. These are the, n no species are necessary to learn, but get a handle on these genera, Sahelanthropus, Artipithecus, 
Australopithecus, Paranthropus, Homo. One thing I'll highlight is that it's only up in here, only up in these times, when you had two different genera coexisting. Paranthropus and Homo lived together on the same landscapes. They shared similar habitats. And that sets up a really interesting ecology in the history of humankind. In these earlier times, there tends to be just one type on, a, on any particular landscape. <coughs> just a more up-to-date phylogeny that includes some new discoveries. If you want to geek out and look at details, you can see something like Kenyanthropus, a different genus. Don't worry about it for our purposes. A lot of scientists don't even agree that this is a good taxon, that it was just so distorted by the fossilization conditions that it looks different, but in fact is the same as one of these other lineages. So there's debates in the literature like that. New discovery of a newly named Australopithecine, Sediba here. Auroran, another genus from way back here with scrappy material. So details, um, lots of them if you want them, but not for exam purposes. And most of these things are clickable, remember. If you want more information, click on a, on a reference and go to the site and read about it. Chad, so the, a team of French scientists persevered here in very difficult conditions in Chad, having found material that led them to believe that there would be more, they continued to go back and return to these really demanding conditions in desert, harsh desert with difficult tribal relations. Um, you helicopter in with your sardines and your water and you try to survive there as long as possible and get out alive, that kind of situation. Um, and they did, they did this year after year and ended up making um, some really important discoveries about an ecosystem that now more or less looks something like that. In the process of working there, they found a cranium of what's clearly a hominid. It's old, old, old. It dates back to six to seven million years ago, which is about the time that's estimated for the split. Here, this nose, this ancient split, of the humans, of the human line, from the great ape line, was estimated on molecular clock grounds, genetics, to be about six to seven million years. And this fossil sits right at that time. So you're getting back to that, that period when you think that the human line diverged from the ape lineages. And some people would argue that this is um, not a hominin at all, but something like a gorilla ancestor. There's a you know, debate of that nature available. Has these big heavy brow ridges above the eyes. Has a relatively short face. If you think about the face of a gorilla or a chimp, it's prognathic, it, the face sticks out, a term you don't need, but they're long-faced, whereas these guys are more short-faced. The canine is relatively reduced, the canine tooth, which in the apes is large, a big fighting organ, um, and also important in intrasexual relations and display. But chimpanzees have a very impressive canine, as do gorillas. Um, a creature like this ha is a, has a much reduced canine, not as reduced as ours, but in that direction. This creature, reconstructed here by an artist, also has the position of the foramen magnum relatively positioned beneath the skull. The foramen magnum is the big hole in the back of your head that leads to your spinal cord, right? Through which all the nerve tissue passes through, leading from the brain to the rest of the nervous system. Your foramen magnum, magnum hole, foramen hole, magnum big, great, the big one the back of your head. If you think about rolling a skull over that big hole down there, well, in, a, in you, in a human, it's, it's positioned at the base of the cranium, such that if you draw a line um, to these osteometric points, it forms more or less a right angle based on that position. Whereas in a chimp, the foramen magnum is positioned high, 
forming an acute angle with those same points. While in Sahel Anthropus, the foramen magnum was at a position that was akin to what you see in later hominins. The implications are taken to be relevant to locomotion because when one is upright, when one is bipedal on two legs, not four, the foramen magnum is below, on the bottom of the cranium. So this condition is linked to walking on two legs by anthropologists. Now remember that for Sahel Anthropus, that's all they have to work with. They didn't find any leg bones or hip bones or other bones that might shed light on how they walk. All they have is the cranium. But the cranium is a very important piece in the skeleton. And, and that was a foundational, that was an earlier view point related to the frame and magnum, and they used that to argue for bipedality of this creature. In an environment like this, that desert back six to seven million years ago looked more like a swamp. Here's a picture from the Okavango Swamp. That's how they reconstructed the habitat in which this thing was walking on two legs. A swampy habitat based on the other fossils they found with this creature. They found ancestors of hippopotamus, they found otters, they found the creatures you'd expect in a swampy habitat and reconstructed it thusly. Yes? It's not, uh, the question was, is this around the time when North and South America came together and there was global climate change? It's earlier than that. But it is, yeah, it's at a, there's much discussion about the role of climate change in the steps in human evolution. And you're not seeing a good evidence for global climate change at this moment. Um, so the, the drivers of bipedality here are typically thought to relate to natural selection for particular lifestyles relating to these habitats. Either a habitat like that one or a habitat like the one we see for Artipithecus. Now, Artipithecus, by some people's reckoning, is the same thing as Sahelanthropus. And that someday, Sahelanthropus will just be renamed Artipithecus, or subsumed into Artipithecus. Now, the, the French workers who spent all those years, or the Chadians who take so much pride in this fossil, they don't want Sahelanthropus to be subsumed into Berkeley's Artipithecus. They want their own creature with its own name and its own integrity, and darn it, it's good. So there's a lot of that. But what happens with you, when you look at the anatomy, and you look at Sahelanthropus, and you look at Artipithecus, which was found earlier than Sahelanthropus and has priority in the taxonomy, and you find they're just the same looking. You can't tell them apart. You can't diagnose them based on any characters of importance in a cladogram. Then you have to call them the same thing because you can't diagnose them separately. So which name do you use? You use the earlier name that has priority, Artipithecus. But that's not going to be appreciated if you speak like that for a lot of people. Artipithecus was found in Ethiopia and is also very, very old, but not as old as Sahelanthropus. From here, whereas Sahelanthropus was over here, if it's the same creature, then it's a creature that lived as a single taxon across that whole area, not too far-fetched. Many creatures are like that today. Here's a, um, an old Berkeley archaeologist who passed away wor working these badlands in Ethiopia, looking for archaeological material on those landscapes. Well, Artipithecus is well known by a lot of bones. Complete skull and then an almost complete skeleton, so much better represented anatomically than Sahelanthropus. The canines... Um, are much reduced, as they are in Sahelanthropus, but you have better material here to, to make metric analyses of the size of these canines, right? Incisors, two incisors, like us, a single canine, and then premolars and molars. And the canines, I mean, they're still sharp, right? Those are impressive. They're not like yours and mine. Um, 
they're little kids, babies, and their little canines are, can be quite sharp and impressive. If you ever look at a little kid's canines, you can see sort of a vestige of this situation. Um, these, however, score low in terms of their diameter relative to chimpanzees and gorillas. They score, these canines do in size, more closely to later Australopithecines and modern humans, which have reduced them dramatically again. Canines that are now thought to be used less in, less in fighting or in foraging and um, with other aspects of the biology of these creatures taking over that role. Particularly, we need to start thinking about the use of tools later in this process as taking over for some of the biological weapons that would have been available earlier in this record. So just a summary slide here. A bipedal creature. A bipedal creature based on, again, we have a whole skeleton, so based on the hips, based on the pelvis, based on the lower limb bones, anatomy that suggests walking upright, but with these long fingers on the hands, long curved bones in the hands, a thumb that's um, not too dissimilar from ours with um, these tufted tips on the fingers that suggest good dexterity to a degree, a general primate um, capability, but somewhat more advanced here but these long curved fingers that suggest a role in the trees still, a climbing ability. Also the long arms. Here's the skeleton. Look at the proportions on Artipithecus. Look at the long, long arm, which is typical of a, a tree dweller among the primates. They have these long arms, these long curved fingers, grasping branches. The anatomy suggests they were walking palm down, on the, on the branches, bigger branches in the trees when they would walk. A big toe, it doesn't come out too well here, I don't think, but this big divergent big toe, a big grasping toe that the apes have. There's Artipithecus fleshed out with the big grasping toe splayed here, shown with its ability, its long arms. Funny proportions, huh? Against, you know, Small in stature, four feet and change, something like that. Hundred pounds, I don't know, something like that. Stand up a bonobo. I just like this juxtaposition. If that's Artie, stand a bonobo up, and that's actually a photograph of a bonobo in a zoo. See its hands, see its long fingers, see its toes of these two bonobos next to a, a reconstruction of Artie. You're real close here. And some might want to debate whether this is, um, you know, the relationship here. Is this on the line to us? How is it related to the chimpanzees? All open for discussion and new discovery. Fantastic. It's a good record. It's a really good record. As fossils go, you know, Darwin pointed out, the record's generally kind of crappy. And scrappy. You just get bits and pieces. You get a tooth here, you get a fragment of a bone there. Here you're getting whole skeletons. Skeletons in an habitat that's reconstructed something like this, a mosaic. A mosaic of different ecosystems. Some, grass, some open grassy areas, some thicker forested areas, lots of edge habitat, edges between ecosystems, rivers running through them, lakes nearby, a rich tapestry of African ecosystems together for the habitat of Artipithecus, based on fossils that occur with Artipithecus, based on chemical analyses of the fossils, isotope analyses that help you reconstruct habitat. And the arguments for bipedality include the traditional ones of moving between patches of habitat that are rich in environments where they can be protected from predators, where these creatures can nest, and rich in food resources. 
in moving from patch to patch of resource-rich items, these creatures needed to navigate an open landscape, the traditional story goes. And if you want to carry stuff, if you want to carry lots of stuff, like a kid and some food objects, maybe tools, although this is early, they're earlier than any good evidence for tools, one of the arguments about getting on two legs is in order to carry stuff. That's a traditional narrative in human evolution. So a natural selection for effective bipedality across open spaces in dedicating the hands to a different type of behavior. Yes? There is, there is evidence for swampy habitats here. There's lots of water. But there's also evidence for open grassy areas that would be better drained. The types of antelopes that eat grasses occur in abundance with Artipithecus. So do the monkeys that live in forests. And then there are always crocodiles and catfish and these types of sites. So it's, it's a mosaic. You've got, an evidence, you've got evidence for lots of different systems. Just announced, um, I haven't even read the paper yet, must admit, this was just announced a couple weeks ago. Earliest evidence for Homo, 2.8 million in Ethiopia. So our genus, 2.8. The previous earliest evidence was 2.4, 2.5, 2.6. So you've pushed it back a couple hundred thousand years with this discovery of a jawbone in Ethiopia. And I, don't, I haven't even really paid much attention to the back and forth, but I think there's a general sentiment that this, this will stick as a member of our genus and thus represent the earliest record. So if you want a number, that's a good one. Earliest homo. The origin of humans, if you use human to refer to homo. Ethiopian badlands, what do you know? Ethiopia is extremely rich in this stuff and um, relatively easy to work. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> None of these places are e easy to work. It's always really difficult, long seasons out there. Um, but there are those who love it, I guess. So we have Homo on the landscape now. Artipithecus is gone, long gone. <laughs> Homo has evolved, and so has this thing, Paranthropus. Remember I mentioned two coexisting genera? Here it is. Your robust Australopithecines living after 2.5 million years ago? For a good million years, the extinction of them is kind of fuzzy, but somewhere around here. A good million years on the landscape, this robust Australopithecine type living with Homo. Because Homo didn't go away. Homo kept on carrying on and would ultimately lead to us. <coughs> Lewis Leakey, made, um, and his family, his, his wife actually found the first of these fossils, um, in Old Divide Gorge, of the robust type. And I said they had big heads, they had really big heads. They had big heads and gigantic teeth. These are the cheek teeth, the premolars, and the three molars, with the incisors and canines very much reduced at the front, so these massive chompers in the back. Big, big head but not on a gigantic body. When these things were first found, some people thought they were giants, you know, 10 feet tall, that kind of thing. No, they were still small things. They just had giant heads. So what were they doing with the giant heads while Homo was there on the same landscapes? That's the ecological question that's so interesting. It's one of the most interesting parts about paleoanthropology, in my opinion. The teeth are not only huge, they're not only absolutely huge relative to yours, they're many times bigger, but they're puffy. And when they wear, they wear smooth. They wear into these smooth little puffy marshmallow-like things. Right? Someone said that once when I was talking to her. She said, they look like little marshmallows. They do. They look like you've pumped your teeth full of air. Something like that. But they have really thick enamel. They're not airy, they're hard. They're hard as can be. The enamel 
that hardest substance that, bio, bio, that organisms can produce is thickly laid on these teeth, on these big heavy teeth, but they wear smooth. So the question as, as to what these creatures, which are known from a bunch of fossils, Ethiopia to South Africa, for a million years, what were they doing? What were they eating? Because in the mammalian universe, your skull and your dentition closely reflects the physical properties of the foods you eat. It's well known from other primates. If you eat leaves, your teeth take on a, diff a certain morphology. If you eat grass, a different morphology. Diets are fairly specific. What were these guys eating is an old question in paleoanthropology and totally unsolved in the sense that you look around and you see all these hypotheses for what they were eating. An old one is that they were eating grass, just cycles and cycles of masticating grass like a gelata baboon. There should always be an analog in the mammalian universe. There's so many mammals on Earth. Mammals are so diverse. You expect to have an analog for any particular diet type. Well, maybe they were more like gorillas, because they don't fit the morphology of a grass eater. They just don't. Grass eaters don't have smooth teeth. They have, like the horses you see, increasing complexity of the enamel surfaces. Increasingly complex. The robusts were increasingly simple. They were just smooth. Well, maybe they were more like a swamp ape, like a gorilla, eating lush vegetation. Or maybe like a panda bear crunching bamboo. <coughs> bamboo is even tougher than grass. Bamboo is grass. It's woody grass. It's even harder to eat than regular grass. And you end up with even more complex teeth, not more and more simple teeth. These things are the most popular viewpoints, and they are the worst in terms of fitting the morphology. It gets a bit frustrating. <laughs> Were they cracking bones like hyenas? Those big, heavy teeth for cracking bones? There's a hypothesis out there for that. No one really took it that seriously, because hyena teeth don't look anything like that. But it's out there in the literature, and you have to honor it, because it's an available hypothesis. <laughs> cracking nuts, like South American monkeys, some of those. Using the premolars to crunch hard nuts and fruits, like that. Another hypothesis, eating below ground tubers, like a mole rat. Don't get me started about the differences in the morphology of a mole rat versus Australia. Just some great big giant omnivore, like a pig. Not just a pig, but a super omnivore. A super bear, a super pig, the robust Australopithecines were. My point is that there is all this information available for this group, lots of fossils chemical information, anatomical information, and we still aren't sure. We have a set of hypotheses that need testing. One thing that is pretty sure is that around this time, after Homo had emerged, when robust Australopithecines existed, around 2.5 million years ago, you get the first stone tools in the fossil record. And at that time, you get the first evidence for large mammal carcass processing, butchery. You get in the form of bones with cut marks on them, in the form of bones with percussion, bones that were broken by tools to extract the fatty marrow inside. So they have these percussion breaks, these little marks that signal where the slices were made on the bones that are well dated to that time, with the stone tools themselves. So early evidence for meat eating, large mammal meat eating. And that's at a time when the brain is, brain is starting to balloon in human evolution. Remember those early guys, they were just on the chimp scale in terms of brain size. Well, the brains start getting larger and larger and larger. Body size is also increasing. But brain size is increasing faster than overall body size. So it's an absolutely and relatively larger brain in the evolutionary sequence, leading through Homo. A big brain is expensive. It's metabolically expensive. Energetically, it must be fed by high-quality food. 
So an old story in anthropology is that the inclusion of meat, a relatively easy to, to digest, high quality food, assisted in feeding an increasingly large brain that would be of value in a selection context for a bunch of things. Having a big brain, if you relate it to social complexity, general cleverness, ability to process information, all of those things are helpful for an organism trying to survive, presumably, in a complex community, a complex world. But you have to feed it. You have to feed it consistently with high quality food. So you can link m the inclusion of meat and increasing brain size in a tail if you want. Recently, a scientist by the name of Lieberman has made popular with colleagues and others the notion that humans are adapted for running. Open country, sustained running. To hunt by persistence, maybe in small teams, to overtake large mammals. Because it's hard to kill a big mammal that has big horns. You can't just do it by yourself. You can't even do it as a small group necessarily without weapons or without cohesion. But what this group is pointing to is the ability to run great distances that humans have and to coordinate, maybe in relay fashion, to wear creatures out in order to overtake them. Now, we don't imagine people evolving with plastic water bottles and Reebok shoes and all that, no. But the idea is there that that ability to run great distances for hours and hours with, in a relay form might have been a, played a role in the evolution of human anatomy. Now, you've got to recognize that that biologist himself, he's a marathon runner. Maybe he's biased about his viewpoints on the record. But it's interesting ideas. Click the links, that information button, this. There's a good NPR story where you can learn more about that if you want. Now, this is in a later phase of human evolution, later homo, um, having maybe been well-equipped with that ability. Longer legs, longer strides, and if you want to link that to getting out of Africa, like this running, running across landscapes to enter new, new areas of the world, you can. Um, no need to get out. Africa's a fantastic place. It's where I do most of my work. I go about once a year, and I absolutely love it. Um, but e evolution's about opportunities, right? Seizing opportunities. And this whole world is blank at this point in terms of big primates. So it's all available space in an ecological sense. So by 1.8 million years ago, there's evidence, great evidence, for humans outside of Africa. In the country of Georgia, Eastern Europe, there's great evidence. In Indonesia, there's great evidence from this same time, 1.8. Big fossil excavations in Georgia, a site called Dimanisi. You can, go to, you can go to a summer field school in Dimanisi and exca excavate. They're finding hand over fist of skulls out of these deposits, complete skulls. Doesn't look like us, but looks more like us than looks like chimpanzee or even Artipithecus. Brow ridge still heavy here, face short, canines highly reduced. This is Homo, relatively large brain, relatively encephalized. It's Homo. But you find so many individuals in these deposits. For the first time, you can do studies of variation in populations. And you see just how different people are once you get a sample of five or seven of them, as opposed to just having a few bones from one individual. And what you see is variation is what, almost like what you see in a room like this. And one of the nice things about this study was it pointed out be careful when you want to name a new species every time you find something, find a new fossil. You must take into account the natural variation that exists within a population. Based on age, this person looks 
much older, based on age, but just based on individual genetic differences and differences in lifestyle. So the variation was captured in that fossil deposit. That's the first wave out of Africa, if you want. A second wave out of Africa occurs with Homo sapiens moving out of Africa. Homo sapiens appearing around 160,000 years ago. Just to jump back there real quick. A reconstruction of earliest Homo sapiens approximately 200,000, 160,000 years ago. Details not important, but out of Africa, Homo sapiens goes. Into Europe, throughout Asia, the earliest cave paintings painted by Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. And we need to get to California in the last two minutes here before we wrap it up. Think about glaciation and the opening up of this land bridge as the glaciers retreat from Asia, right? Glaciers covering the northwest, the Pacific Rim here, leading up to Alaska. But as the glaciers pull back, you have a land bridge opening up by which people could walk to a place like California. And humans arrived in California only 12,000 years ago, 12, 13,000. That's just yesterday. People came here with their fancy toolkits, their domesticated fire, all their sophisticated culture they brought in and then evolved even further in California, such that by the time anthropologists arrived, 64 distinct languages were identifiable in California. All that cultural diversity mapped on all this geological diversity and floral diversity, animal diversity, and human diversity, all developing within California within a short space of time, and then radical changes that ensued more recently. As a final biological adventure, just to show what's underfoot here in Berkeley, that's me and a friend digging a garden in my backyard. And six inches down, guess what we found? We found this little piece of obsidian. It's an obsidian spear point right here in Berkeley. 3,000 years ago. You can always ask a few people at Berkeley at the university and get good info. Take it to archaeology. They say, yeah, it's an obsidian spear point. It's probably about 3,000 years old because it looks like the type from that period. I sent it off for chemical analysis, and it was typed exactly to a volcanic eruption in Calistoga. Glass Mountain, Calistoga, is where this obsidian came from. So it got ported down here to Berkeley some thousands of years ago, fell in the middle of that patch near Lake Anza, and sitting underfoot is much more of that stuff. I have it here if you want to come see it. All right. See you on Wednesday for a review. Please send me any questions that you want reviewed. Um, in the review. Thank you.